interrupt um, what you're supposed to be doing, which is chatting and networking and sharing ideas and thoughts. And um, thank you for doing that, but now you have to be quiet. Um, I'm Kim Hageman. I'm the, the uh, board VP for programs, and it's been my pleasure these past couple years to put together a monthly program um, that fits your needs. And so when you walk out of here, uh, you're going to get an email asking you for feedback, for evaluation. So take time to fill that out because the last question is always, do you have thoughts and ideas about a program that would be helpful? And today's program is a direct result of those kinds of survey results because overwhelmingly people said, ah, what's going on with these new tax laws and what's going to happen to donors? And so I really have tried to read those and be responsive to things that you'd like to hear. This isn't about what I want to hear, but what you'd like to hear. Um, it's been interesting to our board that this year we've had so many new faces come, which is awesome. We love that. And while we encourage you to join, because membership has other perks, but we also recognize that people kind of come and go depending on what the program is. So if that's who you are, we're thrilled that you're here. And hopefully another time the program will catch your interest and you'll come again. Um, next month, we do not have a monthly program, a luncheon, because we will all be where? The Philanthropy Institute, that is correct. It's a great day, so please come. In August, our speaker is Loretta Shelton. She is the Executive Director of the Foundation um, at Four Seasons Hospice down in Henderson County. Um, Loretta has a long, um, very wonderful career in major gift work, so she's going to be sharing some of tips of her toolbox for major gift work, and I think she'll be a great speaker, so come back for that. But today, um, I'm delighted to in, uh, introduce you to Sarah Manning and Evan, um, Evan, Evan, Evan Anderson, thank you, I, it was there, it was there. <laughs> Um, they come to us from Wells Fargo, and uh, this conversation started, I don't know, probably three months ago. We started talking about this as soon as all the tax stuff started bubbling around, and, all, and you all started saying to me, oh gosh, we need to have a program about that. Um, so Sarah has worked very hard and diligently to put together what I know will be a great program. But I, I also want to say to you, if you have questions, if you've read things, if you have heard stuff that they don't address, please ask questions. Um, because we want this to be informative for you, and it may be some things that they haven't thought about either, so we invite you to be participatory. Um, if you're at the back of the room, one of the things on the evaluations is I can't always see the screen. Well, that screen's stationary, but you're not. So if you can't see the screen, pick your chair up and come this direction. Nobody will bite. Bring your glass of iced tea and your dessert and move up so you can see. Um, so Sarah is the Vice President Philanthropic Specialist for Philanthropic Services Mid-Atlantic Region of Wells Fargo Private Bank. Uh, Sarah serves as a VP and uh, she's been with them for many years. She helps charitable individuals, families, and nonprofit organizations work toward their unique goals by providing specialized advisory services. <laughs> and Evan has been with Wells Fargo Private Bank since 2005, and he's currently a regional wealth planning manager responsible for the Carolinas markets. And they brought two colleagues with them who, if they can't answer questions, I think these two gentlemen are prepared to jump up and answer any question you have. So I'm going to turn this over to Sarah, and we're thrilled that you're here. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks for that introduction, Kim. Um, normally when I hear the word tax, I think of an empty room. So um, I'm very impressed at um, the turnout and that everybody took time out of their busy days to come here about this. And I think that it's a testament to what's on everybody's mind. Um, both our clients, of course, have been asking, as well as team members that are board members and other board members just in general have um, been asking. You know, we'd love some thought around that. 
Um, on that very note, we brought our white paper that will be at the back table. So if you didn't get enough here and you want a little takeaway, please grab the white paper. Um, so I always like to start these off with a few philanthropic fun facts. So anybody seen the Giving USA 2018 report yet? Okay, so spoiler alert for the rest of you. Um, we in the United States hit a philanthropic landmark in 2017. For the first time, total charitable giving surpassed $400 billion. That's a lot of good work right there. Um, we saw an increase of 5.2% in giving last year. Um, by comparison, in 2016, the top 10 gifts, right? We all know who some of the top 10 players are out there. Um, top 10 gifts totaled 4.3 billion in 2016. Last year, they came to 10.2 billion. Wow. So a big increase from our top givers as well. And of course, we know who some of those are. The Gates were at the top of the list with 4.6 billion. Mm -hmm. And that will equate to approximately 230 million in additional grants in 2018. So a lot of good work being done there. Um, so I want to go ahead and look at today's agenda really quickly. So first, Evan's going to do a, dot, a little overview on what has changed. We felt this was important to provide that overview of some of the nuances of this tax law reform. Um, then Evan's also going to talk about what may impact your donors. Um, I will do a discussion on what does this mean for your nonprofit as well as some charitable strategies to consider for donors under the new tax law. And then Kim had asked for the bonus topic of Bitcoin. So unrelated to tax, but on everybody's uh, mind with the popular um, cyber currency. So with that being said, let me turn it over to you. Well, thank you for having us here today. I thought Sarah's comments around um, some of the trends in charitable giving um, were interesting. In fact, I I'll tell you, I work with a lot of high net worth individuals and, and certainly over the past couple of years and even into this year, I've never had more conversations around the topic of philanthropy. It is on the minds of uh, folks of affluence and uh, I think they want to see that they're making an impact with their wealth. Um, so hopefully that's encouraging to you as you think about some of the tax law changes because um, certainly I think there's been some concern uh, in the philanthropic space as to what the impact may be. Um, hopefully today we'll share with you some information that will help you process that and, and think through it further. Um, delighted to hear about the philanthropic institute. I'm, I'm predicting that you're going to have a wonderful turnout given the topic of negotiating your salary. In fact, I, I think I may, I may just attend for that reason. Uh, I think I'm not alone to say that we all need help in that area, don't we? <clears throat> Hard to believe, um, feels like old news in the area of tax reform with all that's gone on in Washington uh, over the last six months. Uh, seems like there's a new topic du jour uh, every day. Um, but about, gosh, last fall was when really the news cycle really started um, around what was brewing in Washington in the area of tax reform. The Republicans uh, candidly um, were needing a win, right? They had uh, failed in getting anything done with respect to Obamacare. Um, and they were coming into the end of the year really needing a victory, uh, particularly in the area of tax reform, with midterm elections quickly approaching in 2018. Um, so they had a few things they were looking to accomplish, and they, they were pretty uh, forthright about this, right? So one, one of the key areas with respect to tax reform was lowering the corporate tax rate. Um, corporate tax rate previously at 35% was really on, on one of the highest rates in the developed world, right? Um, so we were just not competitive, and that was an area that a lot of tax practitioners and um, you know business entities were concerned about and felt like it created a lack of competitiveness for U.S. companies. They also wanted to drive economic growth, uh, and then finally they wanted to simplify the tax budget. Um, if you paid attention to how tax reform ultimately was passed, um, you know, it, it, it wasn't a situation where they created revenues to offset um, the, the tax cuts. They, they had to do this on a deficit basis, right? So they did it under 
um, reconciliation, which only required a simple majority in the Senate. So it actually ended up costing 1.5 trillion in um, in government spending over the next uh, 10 years, uh, as as predicted. Right. So how how do we do with respect to these objectives? Um, well, we got the lower the lower tax rate for corporations, so that's now 21 percent, um, which I think uh, is going to certainly uh, in turn drive a lot of economic stimulus, right, and activity. Um, our economists at Wells Fargo and um, other economists, I think, have similar consensus. That at least in the current year, in 2018, we project at least 200 billion of economic stimulus, um, driven by right the lower corporate tax rate, but also favorable depreciation deductions. There's now the ability to expense property placed in service 100% in the year it's placed in service. That's for both new, new and used property. And then finally. Um, you know, simplifying the tax structure, I, I'm not so sure that that really happened. Um, I, I think there was optimism that maybe we could get an individual tax return filed on a postcard. I don't think we're there, right? So uh, we did get, though, um, in defense of the Republican Party, I guess they did simplify it with respect to changing and eliminating some deductions and some exemptions. Um, Maybe in some respects you could argue that both for corporate and personal there was some simplification, uh, but that's arguable. Let's move um, into just a few details on small business tax reform, and then, then I'll move on to corporate tax reform. So small business tax reform, we all know small businesses drive a lot of the economy in the U.S., and Congress certainly was intent on doing something for C corporations, but many of our small business entities are pass-through entities, right? They're S corporations, they're LLCs, they're sole proprietorships. They want to do something that would offset their tax liability because they ultimately get taxed at the individual rates. And so there, there was a provision that allowed for up to a 20% deduction, a qualified business income deduction, um, that is limited through some tests, which I'm not going to get into de detail today, but it's the lesser of 20% or really 50% of your wage base. And then they threw in a provision that also allowed this deduction for um, asset uh, real estate type companies where there's asset um, or other asset intensive companies uh, where they could get some of that deduction as a result. Okay. Um, depreciation deductions that I mentioned earlier, that was a, a key piece that's gonna impact small business tax reform. Uh, and then also, um, we had the 179 deduction, which allows for a greater expensing of property place and service that maybe doesn't qualify for that accelerated depreciation. Sorry, let me get out of the weeds. That's my CPA in me, uh, getting into some of the details in there. Um, let, let me move on to C corporations. I think the, the main changes there was definitely the lowering of the corporate tax rate uh, for C corporations from 35% down to 21%. There was also substantial changes on the international landscape. So our, for our multinational companies, um, th there, is, there are two things. One is they move to a more territorial system, meaning you pay tax where you earn it. Now, it's not that simple, uh, and I am no international tax expert, so I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, but but there, there should be uh, overall probably um, more indifference as to where they do business, um, as to where the best return on investment is. They also changed, and you've heard a lot of this in the press, was um, forcing repatriation of earnings, right? So basically under the new tax act, earnings held overseas that haven't been taxed yet in the, in the, in the U.S. are forced to be repatriated or deemed repatriated. And so these U.S. companies will pay tax on those at a lower rate, 8% for cash, 15% for non-cash assets. And then as a result, um, all this cash we expect, some of it will come back to the U.S. and be reinvested, hopefully, either in the form of new jobs, uh, probably capital equipment, and then also, um, I would expect, some, some corporate finance transactions, share buybacks, et cetera. Okay. Um, I'm going to spend a few minutes a little bit later on in the presentation on the estate and gift tax changes and the individual changes. Um, state and gift tax, there were significant changes. Um, uh, but in a few specific areas. And then income tax changes is where we had more um, broad changes that are going to impact you and your fundraising space. <clears throat> Before I get into those, though, let me just talk about some specific provisions that impact 
um, you know, charities in particular. So the, the, the first portion of the legislation that I want to cover is this new tax for large uh, educational endowments. So this is an excise tax of 1.4% on private institutions, educational institutions, and, and it applies to those having at least 500 tuition-paying students um, and have investment assets valued at more than $500,000 uh, or more for full-time student. Okay. Um, so it, it'll be interesting to see how impactful this will be. It's really to force, hopefully, more spending for students uh, specifically um, and, and not just to hold these large endowments that aren't, aren't um, utilized. Whether or not that policy actually gets affected, we'll find out. Um, it, an interesting fact, it, it, in the original legislation that came out of the House, it actually had that you had to have at least 500 students. And there's a college in Kentucky, I, or I believe it is, um, Berea College, right? Um, and I, I think they went to their senator, Mitch McConnell, who was the uh, House Majority, or Senate Majority Leader, and argued for the addition of tuition paying because all of their students go to school free and it would have impacted them. Mm -hmm. So just a little in interesting fact, later away. Mm -hmm. The unrelated business income tax, for those of you who work with nonprofits who are exposed to this, um, used to be that you could offset um, losses and gains from different uh, UBIT entities. That no longer is the case, right? So if, if you have a profitable entity um, under the charitable umbrella, you're now going to calculate the tax for each um, entity individually and not be able to offset it with those losses from the others. UBIT tax is at 21% as a corporate rate versus 35% under former law. So let me just talk specifically about the estate and gift tax changes. The significant change was the increase in the exemption. So it was doubled. Uh, last year it was 5.49. This year with the inflation, uh, I'm sorry, with the, with, the, with the doubling and the increase to inflation, it, it's 11.18 million per individual. So a significant change for clients who are doing charitable planning just for tax planning. Um, I don't think many of our clients are doing it just for tax planning, but for those who are doing it for that reason, it certainly takes a little bit of wind out of the sails there. However, these, this, this doubling of the exemption is only applicable through 2025. So what, what I failed to mention earlier is um, Congress passed this legislation under reconciliation, and to, to make it work, they had to have some provisions that were permanent, some that were temporary. In the estate and gift tax area and the individual tax area, most of these provisions are temporary, meaning they expire, in this case, in 2025. Okay? Uh, the, I'm sorry, 2026 through the end of 2025. Uh, basis step up remains the same. So the concept of highly appreciated assets where we have low basis, if, it, if a client passes away with those assets, they will get a step up in basis if they own it individually or in, in a rep trust that's includable in their estate. All right, so um, income tax overview. A, a number of significant changes. Uh, th there was talk about minimizing the number of brackets. I don't know if you all recall that um, some of the, in the House in particular, had talked about maybe getting down to three brackets. Well, we're still at seven brackets, um, so that didn't change. But the top rate came down to 37% um, from 39.6. Uh, and then the, the rates beneath that, um, the income thresholds for each bracket Increase. So I think overall, many clients will end up paying less in overall tax as a result. The standard deduction was doubled. Um, so the, the reason it was doubled is because a lot of deductions that clients are accustomed to taking on Schedule A of their, of their 1040 were eliminated. So they doubled the standard deduction to 20, 24000 for a married file joint, $12,000 for single, uh, Sarah's going to share with you some information around how that impacts our taxpayer base, right? How many will itemize versus take the standard deduction? And I think that's really important for us in, in the charitable space when you think about conversations with clients and whether they're going to benefit from charitable deductions 
and there's a few ideas that um, we have that you may want to think about, including your practice. Primary residence rules has changed just around interest deductibility. You now can deduct interest associated with up to $750,000 of acquisition indebtedness. Interest on home <coughs> equity lines are no longer deductible. Um, if you have mortgages that were in place prior to the enactment of this tax act, you still have that million dollar grandfather principal loan balance that you can deduct the interest on. State and local income tax, this is a, a big factor that will affect even many of us in the room, uh, your state and local income taxes now, and that, well, that would include property taxes as well as income taxes, are now limited to $10,000. So if you're in a high income tax state, that was uh, pretty meaningful. Um, it, we were just talking at our table about how folks in Connecticut, a lot of houses on the market, I think people are leaving the state because it's just gonna get expensive and similar in California, right? Most itemized deductions are eliminated, so we did keep this $10,000 state and local tax deduction. We also kept charitable deductions. Um, what else am I missing? Anything else? Interest, mortgage interest expense. But otherwise, um, most of the deductions that many of our clients are accustomed to taking, for example, investment management fees in, in the private bank, that's, that's no longer deductible. A positive aspect of the legislation is with respect to the deductibility of cash contributions. Uh, former law provided that for cash contributions up to 50% of adjusted gross income, the number at the bottom of your first page of your tax return was deductible, now it's 60%. A couple other notable changes. One is this P's rule, which um, really limited clients' deductions uh, by 3% of their adjusted gross income over a certain amount. So for our wealthiest clients who are going to get benefit from charitable deductions, they're actually getting more benefit. Um, so just, just something to think about. Another, another uh, probably for those of you with uh, football teams or basketball teams where you sell seat licenses, this, this may be a sore topic, but it used to be that uh, you know your boosters could deduct up to 80% of seating rights. Uh, no longer the case. Those are no longer deductible. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah, and we look forward to taking some questions from you at the end of the presentation. Thanks, Evan. All right. So what does this mean for your nonprofit? Let me, uh, get my notes here. Um, so, again, turning back to one of my favorite sources, Giving USA. Um, so, Giving USA, in their recent report, um, tends to look at, of course, itemizers versus non itemizers and what are their philanthropic giving patterns. And they um, noted that in 2017, our um, giving, our itemizers increased their giving by 5.5%. Six percent. Let me just flip to my page here. Um, increased by 5.6 percent. But I also want to point out a very important detail that our giving by non-itemizers increased by 3.3 percent. So we give our non-itemizers a lot of um, slack, if you will, and, and suggest that they're not as charitable because they aren't getting the deductions. But um, when in fact, again, they're increasing their giving. So. Hopefully, going forward, we'll continue to see our new pool of non-itemizers continue to increase their giving. So the chart below is also from Giving um, USA's report, and um, it's dated back to 1976 on through the um, history of charitable giving, and again, this is where we hit the $410 billion this year. Um, but notice that beautiful, steady increase over time. Um, we see that one cliff, right, where we know what that was. That was the recession. We all lived through that. Um, but other than that, it's pretty much um, on the up and up with a few bumps in the road. So one bump in the road to mention is back in 1986-87. Um, 1986, it's been reported that a lot of donors doubled up on charitable giving in preparation for tax reform that took place in 1987. So we see that, we see that little uptick there, a little bit of a downturn. But I want to point out though, if you look the year before, I know you in the back probably can't see that, but the year before was actually much lower 
than where we landed in 1987. Um, so hopefully history will show us that while we might get a little bump in the road, that hopefully this line will continue to trend up and up. Um, some economists project that we could see a drop of uh, up, up, upwards around 5%, um, maybe give back our gain that we put in in 2017, um, obviously to be continued. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and give you my off the record opinion in that I'm not sure how many people are gonna figure this out until they go to file their taxes, <laughs> right? Let's think about how we get our news. And the message that we're hearing is more dollars in taxpayers' pockets, right? So when, um, we'll, we'll see how this affects us this year. Um, Charity Navigator is actually reporting that their traffic is up and that they're seeing steady volume and they're really not seeing a dip in activity from their perspective. So hopefully you guys are um, going to see the same steady, slow and steady wins the race through this as well. Um, but what we really want to talk about here, because again, we see a correlation um, more along the economic factors than we do for tax reform. Um, so if we go back and look at some um, the, the S&P, how the S&P 500 compares to the giving. The S&P there is that dotted line, and if you see how it just trends nicely along with the charitable giving, um, research has found that there is a significant correlation here. And think about that though, if you're looking at your brokerage statements and you're looking at your bottom line, and you're feeling really good about the market, and you're feeling really good about that, all that unrealized gain in your portfolio, you are more likely to give a little bit more when it comes to philanthropic giving, and uh, the statistics show that, that that's the case. Um, some other factors go in, like gross domestic product, not as fun to talk about, but another one that's slightly obvious is um, the percentage of disposable personal income, right? Again, more money in your pocket, the more likely you are to spend a little bit more. And so in fact, last year, individual giving as a percentage of disposable personal income saw an increase, rose from 1.9% to 2%. Back to Evan's comments, this is expected to put more money in the taxpayer's pockets, more disposable income. Um, he mentioned small businesses. It is statistically known that small business owners are very philanthropic. So if they're catching some good tax breaks and we're feeling more you know, good about the economy, we're feeling good about some of these numbers out there, perhaps, call me Pollyanna, but perhaps we could see that this isn't such a big bump in the road. Um, there, there's estimated that the number of itemizers is gonna change from 30% of itemizers in the past to 10%. And I don't know about you guys, but that number of only 30% that itemized in the past actually caught me by surprise. I thought there was a higher number out there that would itemize in the past. So um, with that being said, we know that our, our itemizers are typically our highest net worth donors, and our highest net worth donors are typically still going to be philanthropic, right? The, the tax changes aren't necessarily going to catch them off guard. In fact, again, a small business owner, they might be thinking even more philanthropically with all these great um, changes for them. Um, another great study out there, some of you might have heard of it, the U.S. Trust Study in Partnership with the Philanthropic Initiative. Um, it's called the Philanthropic Conversation. I don't know if anybody's seen that before. Um, pretty fascinating. They surveyed advisors as well as clients to find out where the differences might be. Um, so one of the big questions was, who's bringing up the philanthropic conversation? And of course, advisors all said they were, and clients all said they were. Um, but for purposes of this conversation, um, the two statistics I really want to point out, the first one, if you can um, tell here, it says, the motivation for giving is reduced by tax burden. 46% of advisors said that that's the primary motivator for their clients giving is reducing tax burden. And clients said, whoa, 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 not so fast. Only 10% of us are actually motivated by that. Uh, the rest of us, we're actually doing it for the philanthropic mission. Um, and so just a reminder that 
donor stewardship, donor loyalty, um, emphasizing your case statement. This is all going to be very important during this time um, because certainly, again, if this statistic is right, 90% of them are really not that worried <coughs> about their um, tax burden. So um, the next one down below is high net worth givers um, will reduce their estate or will reduce their philanthropic giving if the estate tax is eliminated. Advisors, 40% said that that was the case, whereas again, big disparate, um, big difference. Clients said um, only 6% of them were interested in the tax, estate tax. And, and um, Evan and I have had the privilege of being in some client meetings together. Of course, we intersect when um, we're talking philanthropy. And um, absolutely can say, and sometimes very wonderfully surprisingly so, that donors and, and cli our clients are saying, you know, I want my kids to have this. They're, they're, they're going to be just fine with this. And all the rest needs to go to charity, and here's how I want to leave my legacy. And so certainly we have a lot of really philanthropic clients out there doing it for the right reasons and are not motivated. And according to this, that's absolutely, absolutely the case. So I want to leave you with um, Merriam-Webster's definition of philanthropy, which is, um, the active effort to promote human welfare. Um, notice that doesn't say active effort to promote human welfare and save on taxes. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people are really in it for, for the mission. So let's go ahead and talk about some charitable strategies for our donors to consider under this new tax law. We're going to start with our case study, um, Meet Gill and Belinda. They're not the Gateses, but they are still philanthropic. Um, they are empty nesters and have an annual income of approximately $140,000. It places them in a new 24% tax bracket. Belinda has just retired. They were great savers. The kids are out of that house and off the payroll. They've got some additional personal disposable income, as we mentioned. Um, they love your mission and see all the good work that you're doing. And so they are considering upping their annual gift to $10,000 a year while she's serving on the board. So let's look at this. If you're a visual like me, you want to see what this means. What does this mean? Hopefully you in the back can see that. So deductions in year 2018. We talked about mortgage interest, state taxes, and now if they're going to do that $10,000 gift, that brings them to just shy of what they would do to itemize. Now again, remember, Belinda loves your mission. She's not necessarily worried about this um, whole tax, this whole tax thing. But what are some charitable strategies that she could consider um, under this new tax law? So certainly, this is fantastic that this is still in place. The qualified charitable IRA rollover for your donors that are 70 and a half years old. This is absolutely going to be very important for them um, because again. Now, while um, Gil and Belinda are not 70 and a half, but if they were, um, they will get to avoid that income tax by donating directly from their IRA to your organization. So they're avoid, you know, avoiding that tax in that regard. So still very important. We've heard of some of our clients that are proactively sending nice little letters to their 70 and a half year old donors and just letting them know that this is available because before, it might not have been first on their minds because they could itemize, but now if they're not itemizing, this could be a meaningful tax savings. So um, gift of securities, which we all know that that could be very advantageous. We'll talk about that in a minute, but I want to add the C-Corp business. Again, some savings with our C-Corp businesses. And again, might be feeling a little bit more philanthropic because they've got more money in their pockets. Um, C-Corps can go ahead and run that as a um, business expense. So they're able, maybe not on the $10,000, they couldn't take the deduction personally, but they could take the deduction through their business. So if you have donors that have C-Corp business, that could be an interesting conversation as well. Um, and then, of course, we've heard the industry topic around charitable bunching. We're going to look at an example of what that really means. And then we'll talk about some planned giving vehicles that are worth a, a look under this new tax rule. So. With that, let's look at the gift of securities example. Um, surprisingly, with um, many, many um, donors, 
cash is still the hot um, donation item, right? And yet so many, especially high net worth individuals, have low cost basis assets in their, in their portfolios. And so sure enough, Gil and Belinda, my goodness, they own some great Microsoft stock, and the cost basis <laughs> is only $2,000. So um, this, this is still a meaningful um, tax savings for them to avoid that capital gain by donating the security instead. And so if we look at that after-tax cost of gift, we see that that's a nice little reduction there. Um, I have a client, you know, if I could clone some clients for you guys, he's one. And um, he actually looks at the $2,000 when we sit down with his CPA every year. And he says, no, my after-tax cost of gift is, is not really 100 My after-tax cost or my cost of this gift is 2000 That's all I put into this thing. And now I can do $10,000 worth of good work with the $2,000 that I shelled out. So great way to look at it. Hopefully you all have some great clients and donors that look at it that way too. So let's look at what charitable bunching means. We've heard this term probably and wondered, what is this? So charitable bunching is taking several years of giving and doing it in one year and then taking the future years off to take advantage of that charitable deduction. So here's what it looks like um, to double up. You see the charitable gift line at um, 20,000 and then the second year at zero. Um, and so this allows them to have an additional deduction of $9,600, which it could be meaningful for them. Um, again, Belinda's on your board, so she's probably going to reach out and tell you that she's doing this. But the concern, of, obviously, in the industry is if a donor goes from $1,000 one year to $20,000 next year, how are you supposed to know if they're a charitable country? Right? So um, some opportunity for some donor stewardship there. Um, the other question has come up is how are organizations going to record this? I've heard of a few organizations that are planning to treat them as a commitment or a pledge, and then they'll record it with a, um, a satisfied pledge, if you will. I'm sure your tax advisors can give you the best advice on how to do that. Um, but all interesting thought. I do give the public service announcement to our, our clients that are talking about bunching to please let the charities know that that's what you're doing. So, um, so let's look at an example of charitable bunching with a donor advised fund. So certainly donor advised funds have picked up in popularity. We'll look at that in just a second. Um, but for the donors, so Belinda obviously she knows you, she trusts you. Not a problem. But we have many clients and, and donors out there that say, my goodness, you know, I, I either don't feel comfortable taking a year off. That just feels weird to me. I'm, I'm gonna, um, not going to feel good about doing a big goose egg the next year when I'm a regular supporter, um, A. Or, or B, you know, I'm, I'm not so sure if I know what this organization would do with my two years or three years of money at once. So some of them are turning to a donor advice fund that are treating it like a charitable savings account, if you will, um, where they can do that donation into their donor advice fund. It looks the same, right? But then they set up a reoccurring gift of $10,000 so that for you, gift to nonprofit year one, $10,000 gift to nonprofit year two. $10,000. Um, we have some clients that have been doing reoccurring gifts for, for a long time, so that per se is not new. Um, the one thing I want to point out with uh, the donor advice funds is, again, picking up a popularity record years back to back. So National Philanthropic Trust um, does a DAF study every year. And unfortunately, they haven't compiled all the information for 2017, but um, a lot of big numbers being reported in the Giving USA. So it'll be interesting to see what the compiled report does say. So at the moment, we have 2016 to look at for the industry as a whole, and we saw a growth of 7.6%, um, approximately $23 billion into the donor advised funds. Um, this compares to private foundations of roughly $60 billion for that same time period. So um, at least in 2016, donor advised funds hadn't yet caught private foundations for contributions in, but certainly gaining a lot of momentum. Uh, the one thing I really do want to point out, though, is that third bullet. It says the grant payout rate has been over 20% since 2007. Remember what happened in 2008, mm -hmm. right? 
Um, so the fact that the donor advised funds held steady, even during the downturn, we saw that cliff, right, on that chart of um, giving. The donor advised funds were still holding steady, holding steady, paying out at the same rates to organizations. And so um, back to where this could be meaningful as the, for the industry as a whole, those clients that are getting in there and setting up those reoccurring gifts, they set that money aside. They're not worried about the recession that might happen five years from now when it happens because that money's already set aside, it's already on a recurring gift, and it's already coming. So it would be interesting to see how the landscape of some steady giving could come into play as the donor advice funds continue to pick up in popularity. We all love plain giving. There's some good plain giving vehicles to take into consideration. So. Um, for those of you that might have a charitable gift annuity program, this could be a meaningful conversation as well. So let's remember that our um, donors, Gil and Belinda, they have a big portfolio of Microsoft stock that they've stocked away. And um, it needs to be diversified. It's got some terrible capital gain issues if they were to try to liquidate it as they go. And so should they be considering doing something with a charitable gift annuity? Um, now, they would need to do, the $20,000 wouldn't work, right? Because um, they get a portion, because they're taking income, the full amount is not deductible. Um, but if you got into a higher number on a gift annuity, um, then you could still take advantage of that deduction, if you will. Um, and then of course they're getting the income stream. While it's not a present outright gift, um, still could be a good conversation for those that need to diversify and have um, need that income stream and have that um, have that ability to do so. Um, charitable remainder trusts typically are much larger dollar values, as most of you are probably aware. But again, requires that larger amount that's going to help with that um, offset of the deduction. So, with that, our bonus topic: <laughs> gifting Bitcoin. So, I don't know if anybody has heard about Pine, the Bitcoin miner who set up the Pineapple Fund, and this has been getting some headlines. Um, so he donated, or he, she, I shouldn't have seen, we don't know, He's a, he, she is anonymous, $86 million to the Pineapple Fund in Bitcoin. Um, and the Giving USA report reported that the fund received 10,000 requests. Does that make anybody else get in the hot sweats when <laughs> you think about reviewing 10,000 requests? <laughs> Um, but they ended up donating $53 million to 59 organizations, ranging from $250,000 to $5 million wow. grants. So did some good work with some Bitcoin there. Um, so if you are thinking about accepting Bitcoin, CNBC put out a great article called How to Choose the Best Bitcoin or, Cyber, or Cryptocurrency Exchange does not sound like a fun topic. Um, but it's asking questions like who's running them, who's doing the money laundering and KYC background mm -hmm. checks, what happens if there's a flash crash, all these very interesting topics that come into play when you're talking about a cyber, cyber currency. And let's think about Bitcoin as a gift. So it's actually not as easy as you would think from the donor's perspective. Um, the IRS ruled that it's um, a virtual currency and therefore treated as property for tax purposes rather than currency like cash. Um, which means that how it's acquired is, defines whether or not it can be treated as a capital asset. And um, does it, or ha has it been held for one year? If so, it can be deducted at the market value rate. And here's the kicker, um, it's, because it's treated like property, they'll be subject to the tax requirements of documenting the value, which translates into $5,000 or more in Bitcoin requires a appraisal. So it's an added um, complication even from the donor standpoint on how they're going to undo it. Um, many of the donor advice funds out there are, are accepting it. So there's, um, there's that fun fact too. So with that, hopefully I've cut us, I've left us enough time for a few questions. Um, happy to take them. And Evan, I'm going to call Evan up too because I know we're going to need him. Yeah. Okay. For the most part, this has been way over my head. 
<laughs> I'm fairly new in fundraising world. And this might not even be a question for this time, but or if you can answer it, <coughs> and maybe some other fundraisers can. Is it safe to ass not assume, but is there a picture out there maybe that I haven't realized that with our major donors that we do see that consistent giving larger amount each year, that they're already they're doing that because they have their that's part of their plan giving ahead of time. Do you know what I'm mm -hmm. asking? I mean, is that I mean, I guess I just didn't realize that's where they were getting their funds from. Um, do you, so, you mean impl when they're talking about or thinking about plan giving, whether it be bequest or a vehicle or? I mean, I guess I'm just asking, are, are they already doing that? I yeah. mean, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, I mean, I guess I just didn't realize. Lots of, we work with lots of clients that have channel remainder trusts. And so it's positive with the, this scenario that you're painting is really a positive picture for basically our major donors. Our major donors are still going to itemize. Right, right, right. And in fact, if there's, again, small business owners, the picture's looking a little bit better right now. Um, so the, the fact is we really don't know. It's, mm -hmm. it's suggested that um, it's the group of non-itemizers that when they realize <coughs> that they can't get the charitable deduction anymore, that they might change some of their charitable giving patterns. And we, we just don't know yet. What's the level where you can't Itemize. I heard that, you, that some people can't itemize. Yeah, and, and I think Sarah makes a good point. It probably depends on your donor base as to how this is going to impact you. But um, I think for itemizers, I mean, if, if you're already giving more than $20,000, $14,000 a year in charitable gifts, you're still going to itemize because you're going to pay state income taxes. And then once you add in the charitable deduction, if you don't have mortgage interest expense, that gets you to the standard deduction of 24000 um, so anything, if, if you have donors consistently giving over $14,000 a year, they're probably going to continue to do that to get <coughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, I was just wondering what the level was where you can't itemize Where you can't itemize. So, it, so, so basically you add up your state income tax deduction, uh -huh. which is $10,000. Mm -hmm. If you have any mortgage interest expense, mm -hmm. so let's say the middle class America, right, maybe it's seven to ten thousand dollars mortgage interest and then any charitable contributions it's those three deductions i'll leave you with the back to the visual this is it's going to be different for everybody right you might have donors that have paid off their house do you know that right they won't have any interest to deduct they might have that higher threshold so that's where um evan mentioned the fourteen thousand dollars if they're above fourteen thousand dollars they're automatically because they're capped at ten mm -hmm. on their state taxes um, so 10 plus 14, I guess we don't know if they're paying 10. And, um, so in that range, in that ballpark. Um, they need at least that amount of that deductions amount. in order to itemize. Order. Okay. Right. Okay. But back to um, some people are just not even paying attention to it. So uh -huh. we'll keep up. We'll uh, for budgeting, <laughs> um, could a nonprofit record that as deferred income? That's a good economy. Yeah. I don't know the answer to that. Either. I don't. I don't know that specific. Just, no. So could we split a gift depending on if we knew that person was intending for it to be representative of a multi-year gift? You have to I book the gift. Correct me if I'm wrong. When you receive it, I mean that's how it works. From what I understand, did you they have to yes. about like the well, treating it like a paid up, right, but you, could, you could record it as income, but deferred income, and then mark it as revenue in the following fiscal year, but as deferred revenue. Mm -hmm. Whoever's doing your books, right? It has to be on the same page because um, I, I suspect different organizations might look at it slightly differently based on who's doing their tax accounting. So Make sure if we're audited that we're... Yeah. Yeah. Ask your auditors, honestly. If it comes in, yes, absolutely, because yeah, they're the ones that... The accounting issue, you, mm -hmm. you sought to ask your yeah. accountant. Absolutely. And I will just add that I, I did ask our auditor, and they said, well, we'll get back to you on that, because we don't really we have to think that through. <laughs> so I think we have to be prepared this first year for there to be a little bit of fuzziness around what that looks yeah. like for us. Um, in an earlier example, they were giving ten thousand, and it left them approximately. Well, it left them um, four hundred dollars. 
$600 basically mm -hmm. or $400 less of their deductible. Mm -hmm. um, as a wealth advisor, would you be comfortable advising them to donate more to the charity to reach their deductible? And is that a conversation that would benefit us to have? Yeah, right. So it's worth an ask. Um, we are absolutely talking about function, um, and especially for clients that have the means, right? It's, it's, can they afford to go without two years of charitable giving? Um, and so, the the I love my set of clients who. <laughs> um, it's actually not that they're driven by taxes per se. They're driven by not giving money to the government. Yeah, yeah. Right? And so it might be interesting from that perspective when they say, what do you mean I can't, I, I'm no longer itemizing. And again, for us, a few select clients um, fall into that category. But um, just the, the, the option to give more mm -hmm. to then itemize could be appealing to some that, again, are driven by, I do not want the government to have it. Right. So. It just depends on, right, we all know different donors have different mindsets. Mm -hmm. We all know that donor that comes to mind that is really worried about taxes, right? We have clients like that too, a few of them. But the large majority of the ones that we're sitting down with and planning with are really more interested in the philanthropic mission versus the, the tax. And, and just to think about, if a client doesn't have a mortgage and they're, they're bunching, they would say basically fourteen thousand dollars in deductions, which if you put it in dollars and cents, multiply that times the tax rate, depending on what tax rate they're in. But let's say it's a twenty-four percent tax rate. That's twenty-four hundred dollars federal savings, but you also get to pass through that deduction for state income tax purposes, which uh, in North Carolina that's, that's meaningful. Five point seven five percent. If I call correctly, maybe it's a little off. Any expected uh, behavioral changes for foundations, or is it mostly just going to impact individuals and secret businesses? Um, mostly uh, individuals. The foundations are holding steady. Um, they're required to give out the 5%. So um, it will still be about the mission, making wise investments from a foundation standpoint. Go ahead. I have a question about donor advised funds. Mm -hmm. Is there data available about the percentage of people that are already bunching, that already give a large amount once, and then that gets sort of sent out over the years, or you know, versus someone giving to their donor advised fund once a year? Typically, um, <coughs> yeah, it's hard to know because again, if if we're only twenty percent is paid out uh, on average, right? There's still eighty percent left in the donor advised fund, in theory. And again, I, we see some clients that will spend heavily and other clients that are using it more for a charitable savings vehicle. Um, the, the percentage, at least in 2017, was 8.5% um, of individuals gave to the donor advised fund. Um, so we are seeing them, certainly they're, they're doing more meaningful gifts versus what they're paying out. Um, traditionally. And again, they're typically paying in a large sum and then there's 10 charities involved, right? So. Yeah, I mean, I think anecdotally, just looking and seeing what clients are doing, it, it's been across the board. I mean, you have a lot of clients who are going through a business transaction, for example, where they're selling, there's a large taxable gain and they're trying to offset it. Mm -hmm. Seeing a lot of significant gifts, one-time gifts using donor advised fund. But on the flip side is, I mean, we, we have colleagues who are using donor advised fund just for their charitable giving to simplify and have one uh, place that they make grants out of versus writing six different checks to each organization. So it seems like a wide use anecdotal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> Just one more quick question. Do you think that the increase in giving in 2017 had anything to do with people trying to do that giving ahead of the change of 2018? I think some will definitely try to correlate that. Um, certainly as we are all watching what's happening, that was conversations that were happening with, with clients to just get them thinking about it. Um, we also, you know, we saw a huge increase in December, record December, mm -hmm. and um, it still goes down to clients procrastinate, <laughs> right? right. Um, so there was that going on too. And remember, this didn't pass until just before Christmas, right? I think it was the 22nd. Um, so there wasn't a ton of time mm -hmm. to, to do a lot. Decision. 
Um, it just really depended on how proactive some of the advisors were of getting them thinking about it as we were hearing the, mm -hmm. the rumor mill go around about what might happen. Um, so it, it will be, I'm very excited to see what the next Giving USA mm -hmm. report will say because um, hopefully we'll see, again, not a big drop off. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully the more money, again, more money in people's pockets will, more personal disposable income will equal um, steady charitable gifts. So I think if you come full circle, you hope that this tax reform does in fact drive mm -hmm. economic growth mm -hmm. because it seems like that will drive charitable giving even more so than some of the tax implications uh, on the negative side. Mm -hmm. Well, join me in thank you, Sarah and Abby. I'm sure we'll hang around if we have any other specific questions, and thank you for coming today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.